power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. Oh, so break every chain.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you believe that God has the power to break some chains in this place this morning? Do you believe that God has the power to break every situation that you are facing right now? Do you believe that we serve a God with the power to push back the plans of the enemy for our lives this morning? If you believe, let me hear you open your mouth and say hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I feel as though we already had church. I feel as though we already had church. The presence of God is so tangible in this place. And I don't know about you, but I, I love an environment where God is. Because wherever God is, there is freedom. The scripture says, wherever he is, there is liberty. Wherever God is, there is breakthrough. Wherever God is, there is deliverance. Wherever God is, our needs are going to be met. And I don't know about you, but I came here today with some needs. I came here today with some things that I need delivered from. I know you all look cute and it's holy and it's Sabbath, but I came here today because I need Jesus. And so I'm so excited that chains are being broken. I am so excited that we serve a God who is not too busy, He's not too high and mighty that he can't be right here with us. As a matter of fact, he, he invites us to come. He says, come and let us reason together. What an awesome privilege it is when believers can come together and worship. Praise God. I am so honored to be here today. Uh, today has been wonderful so far. Thank you to the women's leadership, especially Director Rochelle Thomas. Thank you so much for having me and Pastor Knut Brown in his absence. Uh, as you heard earlier, I'm coming with my family from Plantation. SD, I'm here with my amazing husband and our two youngest. I'm gonna ask him to stand so you could see how handsome he is, how blessed I am, and why I worship with so much energy. That's mine, the boy is mine, the boy is mine. And that's Caleb and Abigail. I'm so happy to have him in my life. He's such a blessing to me. I love you so much, baby. And I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your love. Thank you for holding my hand up while I do this with young children. And the mothers in here with young children, you know what it, that's like. And so I praise God for him, and I just honor him as the priest of our home and as the head of our home. And um, I'm just excited to be here. I love the theme. I love this church. I, I already feel at home, and I'm excited to preach. God gave me a word, uh, which I'm so excited to share. So I know time is far spent, and, and so if you don't mind, we're going to get in the word. Um, I'm going to ask you to stand. We are going to turn our Bibles to John chapter 4, and we're going to read verses from verse 5. I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says, So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Seshar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well. Jesus was tired. He was coming all the way from Judea. And this was, it was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour is about midday. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. 
Jesus said to her, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I'm going to jump down to verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of, spring, a fountain of water springing up into eternal, everlasting life. Today I'm going to speak to you from the topic, Do Not Look Back. And if I were to have a subtitle, it would be, Do Not Let Your Past Block Your Future Blessings. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God. Here I am, God, as an open slate, as your vessel, ready, O oh God, available to be used by you. I pray, God, that you use me as a conduit of your glory, as a conduit for your glory. I pray, God, that you, O oh God, will do whatever you see fit, that you, O oh God, through your words will fulfill the needs of your people right here today, God. I pray, God, that you will remove every distractions, God, and allow us to focus on you and so that we can receive the things that we need. Thank you, God, for your presence here with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I was one of those people who reluctantly left Jamaica and came to the United States. And I partly did that to appease my mother who prayed to God for me to leave Jamaica and where I was and come to America because she thought if I didn't come here, I was going to die. And no, I wasn't doing anything illegal, but she thought that the job I had as a journalist was just way too dangerous. And at the time, when, when she was praying, I was in Grenada. This was in 2008, and it was a volatile election season, and I was there working, and it was very hostile. And so if you're a parent, you could understand why she would be concerned. But I didn't understand why. As a matter of fact, I was having so much fun. It was so, listen, it was so much fun to me. I see no reason why I need to leave my good career, pack up, and come to America. What am I going to do here? And so I was there, and I was enjoying my life and doing the things that we do, put our lives in danger as journalists and news reporters. Until one day, I was driving on this hilly terrain. If you know Grenada, it's very hilly. And I was speeding. It, the road was wet. And the car in which I was driving, it went over a precipice. And thank God, I came out scratch-free. I know it's Jesus and the four-wheeler I was driving. But the car went over, and I was upside down for a while. And even though in that moment I wasn't hurt, I was nervous that it could flip over again. And thank God, I, I escaped through the window, and I came out. And I went back up to the main road. And I was standing there. I was so nervous and I was frantic. But in that moment, and, and no, no one knew about the accident because it, there was nothing on the road. The car was over there. And I stood up there, wasn't sure what to do. And in that moment, I realized I had no one to call. I had no family there in Grenada to call. I had no friend. Because... The man I was living with at the time, he wasn't mine. He was married to somebody else. And so I couldn't call him. He wasn't available. And so in that moment, I realized that it's probably not safe for me to be here. And so I bought the ticket, or my mother bought it, and I came to America. And so this was in 2008. And if you're old enough to remember, the well, 2009, you know what season we were in in 2008, 2009.
we were in the middle of the recession, right? So here I am, fresh in America, with immigration issues, right? My mother was filing for me, but it wasn't ready. And so here I was stuck in a house with no job, nothing to do. And I'm like, God, did you make me come here for me to die? Did you take me from my life traveling the world as a journalist writing speeches for politicians and, and, and living in the limelight and being paid well and, and you bring me, did you bring me here to kill me? Sounds familiar, right? The children of Israel. And, and the more I, I looked back on the things that I had and the, the more I thought about the things that I let go was the more depressed I became. And to make things worse, I was in the side room of somebody's house sharing a bed with my sister. Talk about humility. My other roommate is here, right, Tony? And then the person who owned the house was weird. And so we didn't even go in the living room. We, we just stayed in the room. So can you imagine? And I would watch my sister. She's a nurse. And she would get up every day and she's gone. And I was in the room looking on the four walls. And I was depressed. And I kept looking back on everything I had in Jamaica and the Caribbean. And nobody cared that I'd worked for the Gleaner, the prestigious Gleaner newspaper for so many years. Nobody cared they had, that I had gone to the prestigious NCU in Mandeville on the Hill and I had a degree in mass communication. Nobody cared. And so I was there and then I finally mustered up the courage to get out of the house and do whatever I could find. And so I found a job as a caregiver. So I started going into the people's homes and cleaning their homes and taking care of the elderly. And I hated it. But I did it anyway. And all this time I'm questioning God. This doesn't even make sense. And I know I'm not the only one today who has been through something like that. Do we have anybody in here who left another country to come here? You're an immigrant? Wow, that's a lot of you. So then you know what, what transition is like. And I'm sure when a lot of you came to America, you thought it was heaven at first, right? Until reality sets in. And then you realize this is a whole different culture. First of all, some of you, you've never have to work this hard in your life. Speak the truth and shame the devil. Some of us have to work two and three jobs and even when you do that, you still cannot make ends meet. And for some of us, we want to give up the credit cards. We want to be debt free. But before you know it, it's another emergency and we have to go straight back to the credit card. And I know sometimes you wonder, God, did I leave Jamaica to come here to pay mortgage for the rest of my life? I've never seen a place where you pay mortgage until you're 80. Where else do they do that at? And you're like, God, is this really the American dream that they talk about? Or will I be able to ever experience this American dream, God? Or probably that's not your situation. But, but you're, you're asking God and you're questioning God concerning your marriage. Because you're a woman and you absolutely love your husband. As a matter of fact, he's a great provider. But he doesn't understand that you need help in the home. You, you, you work just like him, yet you have to come home. You still have to cook, you still have to wash, you still have to feed him, you still have to feed the children, you still have to take care of yourself, and sometimes you just need a break. Sometimes you just need to rest. And you look good together in public, in church, but behind closed doors he's so disrespectful. And your emotional needs are not being met. But you truly love your husband. And, and you're praying that he would go seek the help that he needs, but he doesn't even think 
anything is wrong with him. And you don't know where to turn and you don't know who to trust and you're calling out to God and you're like, God, is this how I am going to live for the rest of my life? Where are you? Or probably you are the husband. And you're working two and three jobs and you're doing everything to make sure that your family is okay. But for some reason, you have a wife that is just never satisfied. You come home from work tired and all you hear is the things that you didn't do. Or the things that are still supposed to be done. And instead of coming into a safe haven, you're coming into a place of nagging and frustration and misery. And then to make matters worse, she sometimes withholds her body from you as a form of punishment. But you love your wife and you honor the covenant and you honor the commitment and you, you don't want to, to be unfaithful. And you're saying, God, is this the promise that you have for me, God? When I made that commitment and I went to the altar, God, and I stood before you and I said I was going to be faithful, God? Is this how you reward me, God, with a woman, with a wife that cannot even appreciate and see the work that I am doing? So probably that's not even your issue. But you're a young person in the church. And you have been faithful to God. And you're a female. And this is, was my testimony. And you're saying, God, your word said that it is better to marry than to burn, God. But I've been burning for a while now, God. And I've told you that I'm burning. But I don't see the man, Lord. I don't see any eligible bachelors, God, in the church, God. And, and God, my eggs are dying according to, to the culture and the people, Lord. I, I would like to have children. And I have been faithful. And you're wondering at this point, does God even remember me? Is he even hearing my prayers? Does he even know my age? And you're looking back in the past and you're wondering, I wonder if I made a mistake with that guy. I know he wasn't a Christian, but he did say he loved God. And I probably could have worked with him. And you're looking back and you're wondering if you missed something, if, if it was your fault. Or probably that's not even your issue. But you are a young person and you're stuck at home with parents who just don't understand. They think you're lazy. But they don't realize that you're, you're just depressed. You're just overwhelmed with all the pressures and all the things that you have to do. And they just don't understand. And you're praying and you're crying yourself to sleep at night. And you're asking God, what am I going to do? Because my parents just don't understand. And so, whatever stage we are in this life, we have issues. We have issues. Come on, say, we have issues. We all have something that we are looking back on in the past. We have all been there, or we are there right now, or we are going to be there. I pray after this message, nobody goes there. But we have all been there. But I have good news today. Ready for good news? The good news is, we are not the first ones. To ever question God or even have doubts about his goodness. The woman that we just read about in John chapter 4, she doesn't have a name that we know. The Bible calls her the woman of Samaria. And the Bible said that Jesus went to this well. He was tired. He was coming from Judea. From Judea to Samaria is like 30 miles. Some commentators say it probably took Jesus two to three days. There were no cars. He was walking. So even though, for my deep Bible scholars, that we know Jesus came there for a deeper purpose, 
But I truly also believe he was thirsty. Because the scripture said earlier that he was weary. The scripture said earlier that the disciples went to buy food. And so I really truly believe he wanted the water. He wanted a drink. And, and, and Jesus is such a classic. Jesus is such a classic. Because here, here, here let, me, let me set up the stage for you. Because the Samaritans and the Jews were no friends. They were no friends. As a matter of fact, the Jews saw the Samaritans as the scums of the earth. They were not to be seen in public talking to them, much less to eat from them. As a matter of fact, if they eat from them, Tony, it would make them ceremonially unclean. And so for Jesus to be even having a conversation, this whole discourse is interesting because it shouldn't even have happened in the first place. As a matter of fact, Rochelle, the Jews didn't even go through Samaritan, Samaria. And it was a shortcut. They would rather go the longer route because they don't want to, to intermingle with those type of people. So can you imagine this woman coming there in the hot sun, 12 o'clock, and she's coming that time because she's hoping she's not going to see anybody. And she shows up to the well, and there is this Jewish man. I, I, I can just imagine how, how tense this situation is. And, and I don't know if she's like me with my upbringing. I'd probably think it's a ghost. And she's looking at this man, and I can imagine she's wondering to herself, what am I seeing? And Jesus, because he is, is conscious and aware of the relationship that the Jews have with the Samaritan, he knows, and he has a plan. Let me tell you something. If you ever need to, to learn how to do evangelism or learn how to communicate with difficult people, start reading the stories about Jesus. He's such a classic. The first thing he did was show her that she had something that he needed. Ooh, that, that's humility. Can you imagine Seventh-day Adventists going up to another denomination and saying they have... Ugh. Anyhow, let me behave. I want to come back. And so Jesus shows up to this woman and he said, give me a drink. And what Jesus is doing when he said that, he's showing the power of humility. He recognizes his current situation and where he's at. And he's saying, I have a need. and I'm not afraid to beg. I'm not afraid to ask for help. And a lot of times, church, some of the problems that we are having, some of the issues that we are experiencing is because of our pride. Because of our pride, we cannot open up our mouths and say, I need help. You have something that I need. Can you imagine how many problems, how many things will be solved if we say, I need help? He said, I'm, I'm, he said give me a drink. Give me a drink. And let's see what this woman's response is in verse 9 to Jesus' request. The scripture says, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So here she is, going in the past. Going in the past. And because she's so focused on the past, she cannot even see the blessing that is right in front of her. How many times do we miss what is in front of us because we are so caught up, we are so distracted by what happened in the past? 
How many times we have allowed the past to stop us from moving forward. And I'm not saying we, we shouldn't acknowledge the past. I'm not saying it didn't happen. But all I'm saying is we don't need to dwell there. Apparently, nobody told this woman, do not allow your past to block your future blessings. And listen to what Jesus said to her. As a matter of fact, the answer that Jesus gave to her in verse 10, I think, is the answer to the problem that every single child of God on this earth can ever face. Any problem that you have now or you're about to have in the future, the answer is in verse 10. Are you ready for it? All right, let's see what it says. So Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you to serve me. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you what you really needed. You would have asked him for the right thing. And he would have given you the living water. So what Jesus did right here, he basically ignored the distractions. Because he realized that this woman was, a, was, was causing the, the distractions and the past to stop her from seeing what was in front of her. And he's saying to this woman, what he's saying to all of us today... If you really knew the gift of God, if you really understood who Jesus was, those temporary things that filled you up, you wouldn't go there anymore. You would no longer look for those worldly pleasures that only give you a little fix for a time. If you knew who God is, if you knew the gift of God, you wouldn't allow your past to keep you up at night. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking me and you to serve him, we would have asked for the right thing. We wouldn't be asking God for, for the temporary pleasures of this life. If we knew who he was, we wouldn't be asking for those things. He said, if you really knew the gift of God, you would have known what to ask for. And you would have realized that when you ask for the right thing, and when you get the Spirit of God in you, and when you have Jesus in your heart, when you have the power of God, there is nothing that you need in this world to satisfy you. And every single thing you need will be added unto you. We have to understand that the plan of the enemy church is to keep us looking back. Keep us living in regret. Keep us holding on to those things that so easily beset us. The plan of the enemy is to keep us discontented. To keep us comparing ourselves with the other sister. That's the plan of the enemy. To make us think that God has forgotten about us. But Jesus is saying to us today, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking us, who it is that is asking us to serve him, then we wouldn't be caught up. We wouldn't be stressed out with the temporary things of this life. He said, he said you're better than that. Do you know who your daddy is? Do you know who your daddy is? He says, if, if, if the earthly father 
knows how to give his children good gifts. How about me, your heavenly father? He said, how could you ask for bread and I give you a stone? How could you ask for fish and I give you a serpent? Matthew 6, 33 says, seek he first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these things shall be added unto us. All these things. All these things. 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, For eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither hath entered into the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. My daughter doesn't have to cry sometimes. My two year old, she's crying for milk. And I'm looking at her and wondering, does she know how much I love her? That I will never allow her to starve to death? If I know this and I love my baby so much, how so our Heavenly Father? How so our Heavenly Father? God's desire for us, church, is that we will stop looking back on the past. Let it go. Whatever it is that is holding you back, whatever it is that is blocking your vision from seeing the blessing that is in front of your eyes, God wants you to let it go. He wants you to let go of that past hurt. He wants you to let go of those things, of those people who did you wrong. Of those opportunities that you think you missed. And he wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him. He said, if, if, you, if you ask for the right thing. Which is me. And I give you me. He said in verse 13 of that chapter. He said, you will never thirst again. He said, as a matter of fact, he's going to fill you up with, with fountains of living water. Have you ever seen a fountain? And he said, the fountain is going to be springing up into everlasting life. So that means you, you, your thirst will always be quenched because, you see, you're not looking uh, on external things anymore to fill you. But your joy, your joy and your peace comes from God comes from God. And so this woman of Samaria, after she encountered Jesus, and when you go home, you could read the rest of the story for yourselves. The Bible said that she went and told, she told everybody she knew about God. And this one woman saved an entire city for Christ. This one woman. This one woman. There are so many other powerful women in the Bible who let go of their past after they encountered Jesus. We could talk about the woman with the issue of blood. We could talk about uh, Mary and her sister Martha. We could talk about uh, Mary Magdalene. We could talk about Hannah. And so many others. But regardless of how powerful these women were. There is only one woman in scripture in the entire Bible that God reminds us to remember. And it is found in Luke 17 verse 32. It is the second shortest scripture in the entire Bible. And it simply says, remember Lot's wife. And scripture didn't tell us a whole lot about Lot's wife. She, we, didn't, she didn't even, we didn't even get a name. But what we know when we read Genesis chapter 19 was that Lot's wife looked back. You guys saw the skit. And became a pillow of salt. Do not look back. Do not allow your past to block your future blessings. My challenge for you church is that for the next seven days we will stop looking back we'll let go of those things 
that has been holding us captive. Those thoughts, those hurts, those opportunities, those people, whatever it is, we're going to let it go and move forward. We're going to trust in the God that we serve. That's what we're going to do. Can you imagine a church where we let go of the past and move forward and just be content with where we are and where God is taking us? Can you imagine a church where love was truly the theme and not a memory verse? A place where we, we supported each other and we're there for each other and we meet the needs of each other? And it was a safe place where people in the community could come because they, they look up to us and they admire us as people with the answers. Can you imagine a community where husbands truly love their wives like Christ loved the church and, and the women respected their husbands and the husbands were the priests of the homes? Can you imagine families where, where children honored their parents and where parents brought up children in, in the ways of the Lord? A place where young people, young women, young men save themselves from marriage and, and they remain celibate until marriage and they, they marry purpose partners to build the kingdom of God? What a world it would be. If we simply follow what God is asking us to do. What a world. You see, the scriptures were not just given for individual use or blessings, but it was given as a collective body so that we could be the beacon of light in our homes and in our churches and in our communities and in the marketplace. God is depending on us to be the light. God is depending on us to be the light. Would you join with us this week and commit in your hearts that we are no longer going to allow our past to block our future blessings. We're no longer going to look back, but we are committing, our, committing in our hearts today that God, I may not understand what you're doing, it may not make sense right now, but God, I'm committing in my heart that I'm going to move forward. If that's you, just say amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you.
going back I'm moving ahead I'm here to declare to you that my past is over in you all things are made anew surrendered my life to Christ I'm moving I'm not going back I'm moving ahead I'm here to declare to you my past is over in you all things are made new surrender your life to Christ moving moving your past looks like whether it is good or whether it is bad and frankly Jesus doesn't care either because he has something better for you what God has for you is better it's something that you're not seeing yet. it's something that your eyes have never seen and your ears have never heard and your heart cannot even imagine or conceive because he, he didn't even put it in your heart yet. He said, what I am preparing for you is going to blow your mind. If you just decide in your heart today to let go of your past, to just let it go and trust me, move forward he said I'm going to blow your mind you see when I decided that I was going to let go and move forward with God I had no idea church listen to me I had no idea that I no longer had to worry about those men who weren't mine because he was going to bless me with a mighty, powerful man of God who would lead me into this very church. I had no idea that once I decided to let go of my past and trust God to move forward, that he was going to use my experience as a caregiver to allow me to open four home health agencies in Florida employing over 1,000 people in Florida I had no idea when I had to leave that job that I was worrying about that God was setting me up he wanted me to be an employer and not an employee I had no idea when I was in the side room of somebody's house that once I decided to let go of my past and move forward, he said, daughter, I I'm not even letting you take a mortgage. I'm going to allow you to buy the house that you want cash without a mortgage. You're going to be completely debt free. Anything you want cash. And then he wasn't done yet. He said, daughter, I didn't forget that you have a degree in mass communication. I'm going to use you to speak all over the world and I'm going to use you to encourage people and share your story and I'm going to make you into a good news reporter for the kingdom 
So when I'm telling you this, I'm not speaking a, a, a rhetoric or some statement. I'm talking to you because that is my testimony, a fact. This is the truth. That when you let go of the things that you thought were good, God has something. And he told me, he, he told me the other day, he said, I'm not even done yet. You haven't even seen nothing yet. And I want that to be your testimony today. I want that to be your testimony. I want that to be your testimony. But all he's asking us to do is let go. Let go. Trust that him, our heavenly father, is able to take care of us, his children. He said, if we only knew, if we only knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking that he's asking to serve him he would ask for the right things but unfortunately James 4 2 to 3 says we have not because we ask not and then when we do ask we, we, we ask amiss we ask with the wrong motives but we're going to change that today we're going to change that today because what I love about God, Stephanie, he's a God of mercy. He said that his grace, hallelujah, his grace is renewed every single day. So every single moment that you're still breathing, every single morning that you step off that bed, it's a new opportunity to say, God, I surrender. God, I repent. God, I'm ready to turn a new leaf. So could we make it that this Sabbath is the day that we will commit in our hearts that God, even when I don't understand what you're doing, even when, when it doesn't make sense right now, I'm going to trust you. God. I'm going to trust you. And so I'm going to make two appeals right now. My first appeal is for the believers. You are a Christian. You've already accepted Christ in your heart. But for some reason, you're still holding on to some things. For some reason, you're still holding on to some mindsets and some belief systems and some people and some systems and even some spirits. But you heard the word today and, and you feel as though God is speaking to you and you want to make a commitment today to move forward. Because you are saying to God, God, I'm going to surrender to you in this moment. I'm not going to make another day pass. I'm going to surrender to you today. And if this sounds like you, I want you to step out of your seats as a sign of faith to God. That you are serious and I want you to meet me at the altar so that we could pray together. This is a moment between you and God. Don't worry about who is watching, who is looking. This is a moment between you and God. Whether you're a boy, a girl, a female, a male, a child, you are walking up in faith to say, God, as you come out of your seat, it's a sign of faith of, of actually moving forward. That's actually what you're doing in the spirit. If that is your declaration today, if that is your commitment today, if that is the posture of your heart today and you want to make a change in your life, I'm encouraging you now to move forward. Move forward. Move forward. Move forward. God is doing a new thing. He said, behold. He said, behold, I'm doing a new thing and you shall see it. Hallelujah. We'll wait on you. We'll wait on you. We will wait on you. God makes all things new. God loves us so much. And then I'm going to make us my second appeal. My second appeal is for those of you who are here. 
and you have not yet received Jesus in your heart, this is your moment to join us at the altar as a sign, as a commitment to say, God, I am ready to be filled with this living water. I am ready, God, to fully surrender my heart to you. I am ready to be in covenant with you. Because if we're not in covenant, if we're not in relationship, we can't make demands of God, right? So the first step we want to do, we want to make sure that we are, we are in relationship. We are his children. We, we, we are saying, God, you are my Lord and you are my God and, and you are the ruler of my life. That is what you're saying when you give your heart to Jesus. Besides, now is not the time anyhow to be outside of God. With this evil world, how risky to be outside of God in such a time as this and so I encourage you if you have not yet accepted Jesus as the Lord of your life I would love to extend this beautiful opportunity from the Lord to come come while there is still time come while the doors are still open we're going to pray father Father, here are your children, God, who have come to meet you at the well. Father, 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 here are your children who have come to meet you, God, at the well. Your word said, God, that we should come, come to reason together. God, we have recognized that we have sinned and we have fallen short of your glory, God. And so we come at this altar today, God, repenting before you, God. We repent before you, Jesus. We renounce everything within our hearts within our minds within our souls within our bodies god that contradicts who you are that contradicts your word that contradicts even who we are as believers god and we pray god that you oh god will lift up a standard in our lives that you oh god will fill us up with that living water oh god so that we will never thirst again Jesus I pray oh God that you oh God will supply the needs of all your children at this altar God you have created every single one of them God you have made them in your own image and in your own likeness and these are yours oh God and God, they have walked at the altar. We are at the altar, God, in full surrender to you. We are saying, God, we surrender, Father. There, there were some things, God, that we were holding on to, God. There were some things, God, that, that we were looking back on. But God, we, we make a commitment in our hearts today, Jesus, that we are no longer, God, going to allow the past to hold us back. We are no longer, God, going to look on the people in the world, God, and wish, God, that was us. Because you, we know who you are. We know the gifts of God. We know your power. So God, we renew our hearts and our minds and our souls in your hands today, Jesus. We come against every plan of the enemy for them, God. We know that the enemy will come to even try to steal this word. But I pray in the name of Jesus that this word today, God, will fall on good soil, Jesus. I pray, God, that this word, oh God, will, pro will, will provide, will, will bring forth fruit, oh God, in the lives of your people, Jesus. I pray, God, that they will experience transformation, true transformation, Jesus, after today, God. 
I come against every plan of the enemy for their lives. I come against every plan of the enemy for their finances. In the name of Jesus, I bind up the evil works of darkness over their lives. Every lie that the enemy has told them, we cut it down in the name of Jesus. We cancel every plan. We cancel every evil works of darkness. We cancel every demonic forces of darkness. We cancel every spirit of witchcraft over their lives. We cancel every plot of the enemy, oh God, to keep them in, in bondage and in the past. In the name of Jesus, we pray, oh God, that you, oh God, will pull them out of every demonic portal and stronghold and marketplace, God. That the enemy have, oh God, some of their minds, oh God. We pull them out of depression in the name of Jesus. We pull off depression of your people. We pull off anxiety, the spirit of worry. We declare that you must go now in the name of Jesus. Spirit of worry, release God's people now in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus at this altar. We plead the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus over your people. The blood of Jesus. Loose your people, oh God. Loose your people, Father. Set your people free to do what you have called them to do. To go in the places you have called them to go. In the name of Jesus, we pray that these at the altar will be blessed in the city. And they will be blessed in the fields. And they will be blessed and when they come and when they go. They will be lenders and not borrowers, oh God. We pray for these at the altar, Jesus. That a thousand may come at their side and ten thousand at their right hand. But it shall not come near them. Because only with their eyes will they look and see the reward of the enemy. We pray for these at the altar, Jesus. That no weapon, no weapon, no weapon, no weapon, no weapon that is formed against any one of them will be able to prosper. No weapon. Because they belong to you, Jesus. They belong to you, Jesus. So we pray, God, for financial increase. We pray for financial breakthrough. We pray, God, that you meet their needs. We pray you supply all their needs according to your riches and glory. I pray, oh God, that they will lack no good thing, Jesus. I pray you will show up for them, God. Show up for their children. Keep their children out of trouble. Keep their children out of danger. I pray that their children will not be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We cancel the statistics of death from off their children's life. We pray against every adversary trying to put our boys in prison. We bind it up and we send them back to the pit of hell. In the name of Jesus, we declare that our daughters are safe. We declare that our sons are safe. David said, I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. We declare in the name of Jesus that we of the house of God, that we the people of God shall never beg for bread. We shall never beg for bread. We shall never beg for bread. We shall never beg for bread. Because we know who we serve. We know the gift of God. And so we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God, for the chains that have been broken today off your people. We thank you, God, for the deliverance that has taken place. We thank you, God, for the encounter, God. That you are here. And I pray, God, that you will be with us forever. You will not leave us after today. This will not just be a, another service, God, but you will remain in our hearts and we will continue to move forward. And God, now I bring those at the altar, God, who have indicated that they want to give their hearts to you, Jesus. We pray, God, that you will save them now. Save them now, Father. Save them now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you, Westbark. 
and grant you his peace. Jesus loves you so much. Go and move forward. Hallelujah.